Greetings, children of the screen. You're from the neighborhood nerds coming here once again, coming at you with another disease dose of Crossed. This time we're going to be taking a look at Cross Badlands number 54, the fifth and penultimate issue in the Thin Red Line story arc. Now, if you missed the previous issue, a card's popping up right now that'll take you to the Cross playlist that has not only that video, but every other Cross video I've ever done. So definitely check that out. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure to subscribe and hit that little bell so that you don't miss out on the next video. So with no further ado, let's once again enter the world of despair, the world of doom, the world of death. The world of the cross. We open on patient zero, eyes closed, deep in contemplation and struggle as sweat rolls off of him. Fragments, Fragments in his mind, mind. the desert, the desert. Slashing, slashing children's, children's throats, throats. Tying, tying men to cannon, to cannon, 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 cannon muzzles, Bin Laden, Laden pointing, pointing at a child bride, the second the tower crumbling, crumbling stuck in, in freeze frame, frame on a flickering on flat, flat screen. screen. He then feels that he's not alone. Through the observation glass, Alistair watches patient zero. Not being able to see him, Zero calls out if anyone's there, but Alistair is gone. We then zoom over to catch up with Jackie and Thomas, who are hunkered down in a ravine as about 200 cross fill the area around them. Frantically, Jackie is trying to reach any military personnel over the radio, but there's no one there. Back in the bunker, the Prime Minister and his people are trying to determine what to do about the oncoming cross-controlled airstrike, which will potentially kick off full-blown nuclear warfare. All of their Air Force facilities seem to have been overrun and they haven't the manpower to launch a proper interception force. However, there are several secretly located hangars, each with a highly advanced aircraft designed to deliver a nuclear payload. It is determined that their best course of action might be to simply send one of these to bomb the crossed airstrike force over the Atlantic. Something that hopefully will defuse the situation would require only two pilots, which is convenient as they had just received word of Jackie and Thomas. After a moment of contemplation, the Prime Minister turns to Harry, asking if he and his men could go out and retrieve the pilots. Harry argues that his job is to not leave the Prime Minister's side, and that any unit could be dispatched to retrieve the pilots. But the Prime Minister rejects this, telling Harry that those men haven't been down here listening to everything that's been happening. They don't know the stakes. He then says that he could make it an order, but the fact is that there's just no one else that he trusts more to get this done. Please. Moments later, down in the observation room, Harry stands with Dr. Chopra, observing the sleeping patient Zero. He came down there hoping to get more information about what to expect out there. With heavy, broken eyes, Dr. Chopra states, This could end us. I've honestly never seen anything like this. The way it behaves, the way it mutates. No antivirus is going to be able to keep up with it. Looking at it close up, you start to think about rewriting the periodic table. It's like something from another existence. If you actively set out to design something to do away with this, you couldn't come anywhere near this. I'm starting to wonder if it's something in the DNA, something that was there from the beginning. Harry questions, in ours? To which she responds, the planets. Harry again questions. So what would that make him then? Well, we know he's not unique. If whatever it is just somehow manifested at this moment that it was meant to, I don't think there would have to be anything remarkable about him at all. To which Harry responds, wrong place, wrong time, that all. But she just states monotonely, wrong place, wrong moment in human destiny. A few minutes later, Harry's boys are packed up in the transport and ready to go as Harry briefs Gary, the big Dolph Lundgren looking motherfucker. But in the middle of it, Alistair rushes over, demanding that if Harry's going to just piss off, he needs to know who's going to be left in command. He prattles on about being the Prime Minister's right hand, making a proper fool out of himself. Harry introduces the two, stating that, as Gary just heard, Alistair is the Prime Minister's right hand man. Alistair barks at a bemused Gary for a moment before storming off, 
but Harry assures him that he really has nothing to worry about, it shouldn't be a problem. Alistair won't stick his head out from underground unless he absolutely has to. Harry loads up with his men and they begin to head out. As they drive away, Jock tells Harry that he loves how he said, Right hand man. When Harry questions what he means, Jock just chuckles as he responds, For fuck's sake, Harry, even I could tell you were calling him a cunt. Back on the moors, Jackie and Thomas have taken refuge behind a ruined bit of building. Jackie continues to call for aid over the walkie, but Thomas tells her just to knock it off for a while, she's only going to run down the battery. Jackie questions, almost jokingly, how he, a navigator, could have possibly gotten them so hopelessly lost. To which he replies that they've been being chased all over the place and there are no stars visible. Just when it seems like they might actually break into a proper argument, a voice comes over the walkie-talkie. Tango 1-6, this is Bravo 1-0, over. After responding that they are lost, they're asked if they can fire off a signal shot to help the team home in on their location. If they can communicate over the walkies, then they're close. But to do so would draw the attention of the infected, but Harry asks them if they have any better ideas. So they respond that they will fire three spaced shots for them to hone in on. Thomas fires the shots and immediately the crossed come running. But as the infected close in, suddenly everything is flooded in a wash of light and gunfire breaks out. Harry and his boys have arrived. They drive in between the horde and the two waiting soldiers, opening fire with their gun mounts, creating suppression fire, allowing for Jackie and Thomas to climb in, and then as quickly as they arrived, they're gone, speeding back towards the bunker. Back at the bunker, Alistair tries to convince Gary of what needs to be done. But Gary would really like to hear it from the Prime Minister himself. However, his respecting of the chain of command means that Alistair is able to logic him into complying with his wishes, saying, I assure you, this is the way to go as long as you choose the right men for the job. Gary responds with, I wouldn't worry about that. The two that I'm thinking of are right towards the end of the scale for your requirements. We then move down to the observation room with patient zero as Alistair's dialogue continues. Look, look, look I know I that, know it, that seems it seems strange. Strange. It's, not it's not how any of us would want to do things, do things. But, the but the situation is about is as far from normal, normal as anything can get. get. Patient Zero awakens, feeling something wrong, and he moves towards the observation window. Our people, our, people, our, whole, our whole country, country everything, everything is in jeopardy, is in jeopardy here. here, here. And, this and this little bastard, bastard is the key, is the key to, the to the whole thing. thing. He's, the, He's one the one that started, started it all, and it's time it's we time found we out exactly out what he knows. That's what That's the, the Prime, Prime Minister, Minister believes. believes. That's what, That's I, what I, think I think too. too. So let's do what we have to do, and then we can put this bloody nightmare behind us. And with that, Patient Zero suddenly realizes he's not alone. Someone's in the room with him. Behind him, he turns, and two large men in hazmat suits are bearing down on him. And that is where this issue leaves us off. Now, this is normally where I would come in and I would do my analysis, both the writing and the artwork. But frankly speaking, because of the nature of the story, the last few videos, I've pretty much just been saying the same things over and over again. And so since this is the penultimate issue, I'm just gonna save all that for the end whenever I can talk about the work in its entirety. But that doesn't mean that you can't talk about this issue, so let me know down in the comments below. What did you think, children of the screen? Thank you very much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it, and I cannot wait to cover the final issue with you guys. See you next time. Nerd Scum, out.